Imagine you just got your license to drive and your very first car. School's out for spring break, so you're headed on a little daycation beach trip with your best friend. The sun, the sand, and well, the unexpected evil that's lurking in broad daylight. High school students Megan Carr and Cherish DeSantis had no idea this short trip would be their last. Hi everyone, welcome back to my channel. My name is Kimberlea. If you've never been here before, nice to finally meet you. This is one of those cases that doesn't have many photos. I wanted to say that right off the bat, a lot of you don't even watch, you listen, which is amazing, but that shouldn't be a reason why I don't cover a case. And sometimes that's just the way it is. Not everyone had the type of lifestyle where they were taking a bunch of photos and their stories don't get as much attention as others. Therefore, there are not as many pictures online. But just let your imagination guide you because this story is too insane not to tell. And yes, this is another spring break homicide. And it's also in Florida, like the last one, not on purpose. They both caught my eye when I was researching and I saved them for this time of year when many of us can relate to wanting to get away for a little fun in the sun during spring break. I'm gonna be leaving on the 26th for a little spring break weekend myself. However, before we get into the video and the story for today, let's thank our sponsor. I want to thank our loyal sponsor for today, and that is PDS Debt. I'm almost done moving, but oh my God, has it come with so many unexpected expenses. Who would have known that you had to pay junk removal services to take away things that you don't want anymore? And I just had a New Year's resolution to save money and it never ends. And then it adds up to debt. And I've been there so many times. And if you're like me, you probably wish there was a better solution to paying off your debt. Well, our sponsor for today, PDS Debt, has customized zero interest options for anyone struggling with credit cards, personal loans, collections, or medical bills. Now is always the best time to get serious about a better plan to pay off your debt. You don't wanna wait, especially because inflation is here to stay. The programs from PDS Debt make a real difference in your day-to-day -day life by saving you money the same day that you get started. And PDS Debt is giving qualified viewers a free debt saving analysis just for completing the 30 second online debt assessment at pdsdebt.com slash Kim. You'll receive a full breakdown on how to save on interest each month and the quickest way to take care of your debt. If you're making payments every month on your debt and your balances aren't going down, then this program is for you. What I like about PDS Debt is they roll all of your payments into one low zero interest monthly payment. Everyone with over $10,000 or more in debt qualifies and there's no minimum credit score required. Bad credit and fair credit is accepted. They help you save thousands in interest and fees and pay off your debt in a fraction of the time. So take back your financial freedom today by visiting pdsdebt.com slash Kim. That's pdsdebt.com slash Kim. And thank you so very much to PDS Debt for making this video possible today. Now let's get into the case. I'm always so thankful that I do have sponsors because YouTube doesn't always play nicely with this kind of content, as I'm sure you are aware. So if you're ever thinking of what brands to support, think about the ones I've spoke about on this channel because they have so graciously trusted me with their brand and help make these videos possible. Now let's get into the story for today. Even though I told you this is another Florida case, we will be beginning this case in Thomasville, Georgia in the spring of 1992 where two best friends are in their junior year of high school at Thomasville High, Megan Carr and Cherish DeSantis. They're probably destined to be best friends because they were born only one day apart in 1975. They'd been lifelong friends since childhood and were inseparable. Cherish Fountain DeSantis, who friends called Sherry, was born August 29th in 1975 in Thomasville, Georgia, to Peter Angel DeSantis Jr., known as Pete, and Hazel Stapleton DeSantis, who went by the nickname Dot. Cherish was born with beautiful, natural red hair, which would become a very prominent feature about her throughout her life. Her best friend, Megan Marie Carr, was born, like I said, just one day later on August 30th, 1975, also in Thomasville, Georgia, to John Clark Carr and Shirley Singletary Carr. She had one older brother, John Clark Jr., who was six years older than her. Thomasville, Georgia. Well, let me tell you about this place. It had a population of about 17,000 people in 1992. It's that little tiny red dot on this map. Only about 35 miles from the Florida state line though. Thomasville is known for my favorite flower, 
Call me basic, but it's the rose. I love roses so much. And Thomasville is known as Georgia's Rose City. They showcase nearly 2,000 different blooms at the Rose Show and Festival every year. It's a quaint, unique little town filled with charming boutiques, cafes, and southern hospitality. So what's it like growing up in a town like Thomasville? Well, it can vary depending upon your status, that's for sure. And both Megan and Cherish's families were well off. Megan's dad, John, he owned and operated a water well drilling company, and it had been in the family since the 1940s. It's estimated that his company made around $2 million a year. So they were definitely living a very comfortable lifestyle. And by 1992, Megan's parents were divorced though, so she was living with her mom, Shirley. As for Cherish's dad, he was very well known in Georgia and internationally. Pete DeSantis grew up in Thomasville as well. He attended Thomas County Central High School, but then he went on to graduate from John Marshall Law School in Atlanta, Georgia, where he obtained his law degree. And after that, Pete got into the tobacco business. He was a world-renowned tobacco auctioneer and had auctioned tobacco for more than 30 years. He opened and owned DeSantis Auction Company in 1981, an auctioneer training center incorporated, where he actually trained other people on how to become auctioneers. He was a member of the National Auctioneer Association and Pete had been appointed by numerous governors to the Georgia State Auctioneer Commission. And on a number of occasions, he was also named the National Auctioneer of the Year in the tobacco industry. And I don't know how you feel about that, but this is how he made a living. These types of tobacco auctions are almost a thing of the past, considering the tobacco industry saw such a decline in smokers since people became educated about the dangers of cigarette smoking. But it was still a very booming business back in the 80s and early 90s. And once Pete had made a significant income, he got into real estate and he owned many other properties between Georgia and Florida, but the home that the DeSantis family lived in out in Thomasville was in a very rural area. It was tucked away from everyone else. It's in a location called Olive Creek and it's so private, I couldn't even find any information whatsoever about this area. I was able to find a home that would most likely have been similar to the one that the DeSantis family lived in and I'll put it up on the screen. Now this isn't their home, but it's one in the same neighborhood, also four bedrooms and four baths and over 3,000 square feet just like the one Cherish's dad owned. As you can see, it's a very nice. This area actually reminds me a lot of the one the Murdoch family lived in out in Moselle, very private. And the DeSantis family lived on almost eight acres of land. However, it was only a 15 minute drive away from Thomasville High School because they were living in a small town. I'm not sure how Cherish and Megan met, probably from going to the same schools but they did have very similar lifestyles and they could have met in clubs they were a part of. I don't know which ones they were in as kids, but by high school, both of them participated in sub debs and Kappa Tri High Y. Sub deb stands for sub debutante. And this means a woman is not yet a debutante, but on her way to becoming one. And a debutante is a young woman of an aristocratic or upper class family who has reached maturity and is a new adult that's presented to society or uh, men. Yes, it's their formal debut. And considering both girls participate in this elite club as teens, maybe they met in similar ones as children. Subdubs are basically high school sororities and its members were very involved in social activities. Many of the girls who participated were seen as smart, beautiful, well-dressed, wealthy, and from some of the most well-known families in the area. So it's no surprise Megan and Cherish became so close. They also participated in Try High Y, as I mentioned earlier, which is part of the YMCA program and has been active with young adults since 1850. And the high stands for high school, the Y stands for YMCA. And YMCA, if you don't know, was originally only for men, the Young Men's Christian Association. But eventually the Try High Y clubs were later formed for girls. And the Try was for their purpose being threefold, create, maintain and extend to the fullest capacity of one's ability throughout the home, school, and community, high standards of moral character through improvement, brother and sisterhood, equality, and service in high schools. Megan and Cherish were very popular. They were part of the cool kids on campus and both were 16 in 1992. Cherish had a long-term and serious boyfriend at the time. His name was Alex Hunt. 
and they were very close. And they would do what typical teens their age would, drive fast in their cars, listen to loud music, and get in a little trouble. But all in all, they were good kids. Megan's mom, Shirley, was a little stricter, maybe since she was raising Megan all on her own, but she would definitely make sure her daughter was in line. But as long as she was getting good grades and doing her chores, Megan was allowed to partake in extracurricular activities. Her favorite thing to do was perform with her color guard team. They did choreographed dances and routines for the school marching band. They're usually seen flipping flags in the air, and Cherish was a cheerleader. They were both part of the drama troupe together. The Thomasville High School juniors and BFFs were attached at the hip. Whenever you saw one, you saw the other. They would walk the halls together every day, and their assistant principal, Mr. Andy Jones, would always try to find a way to make them laugh or smile, which wasn't very hard to do. The girls loved to have fun. That's why they were really looking forward to spring break. Their last day of school was Thursday, March 26th, and the 27th, which was a Friday, was a teacher's planning day, so there wasn't class. And then they were off until April 6th for spring break. Their first order of business, getting some sun at the beach. Not in Thomasville, of course not, over the border into Florida, where else? It was customary for Thomasville students to venture over the border into Tallahassee, Florida, and take one state road, US 98, about 80 miles all the way to the shore. It only took about two hours, and the drive was pretty fun with lots to do on the way there. There was a one beach in particular that was popular among teenagers from Thomasville, one that wasn't overrun by tourists. It was called Bald Point. It's an eight mile stretch of shoreline on Alligator Point Peninsula on the coast of the Gulf of Mexico. And it's part of the Bald Point State Park. As a native Floridian, I had never heard of this place ever. That's why I love doing these cases and researching because I learned so much. The park where the beach is located is known to have some of the most picturesque scenic areas along the North Florida coast, including coastal marshes, pine flatwoods, and oak thickets. It's a popular destination for bird and wildlife viewing, and yes, there are alligators there, which is why it's called Alligator Point. But why Bald Point? Well, each fall, bald eagles migrate south to this area. Now, when I heard this, this isn't exactly what I would think of when someone says they want to spend a day at the beach. Not really, but the beaches there are very pretty. The park is open from sunrise to sunset, and there's also a picnic area, restrooms, and a boardwalk where you can enjoy all the sights and sounds of the marshes as you crisscross the park towards the beach. Once you get there, it's just water and sand as far as the eye can see. There are some homes in Alligator Point community. It's just outside the park, but they are few and far between. So that was the plan Megan and Cherish had to set off on Friday morning around 10 a.m. and spend the day at Alligator Point. They spent the night before together on Thursday night watching movies and having a sleepover. By the morning, they were packing their beach bags with bikinis and flip-flops to set off for Florida, planning to return home by the same evening. A couple of their friends had planned to come along, but one of them ended up having to babysit and the other one changed her mind at the last minute. So it was just Megan and Cherish. Megan was driving her black late model Honda and they made three stops along the way. First at a convenience store, maybe to get snacks and gas, then at the state line store where a lot of people buy souvenirs, and finally a sandwich shop before arriving at the beach. They got there sometime around noon. Megan parked her car. The girls set up their beach blankets, donned their bikinis, and tuned in to a local rock station on their battery-operated boombox as they basked in the sun together. There wasn't much to do except for swim and suntan, but that's exactly what they came there for, with not a care in the world. A relaxing day at the beach. A couple hours later, an off-duty police officer from back in Savannah, Georgia, who was on vacation, was strolling down the Bald Point Beach with his wife. They saw the girls laying out in the sun and they made sure not to intrude on their beach day. They didn't want to step on their blankets, so they made a wide sweeping turn to give them their privacy. It's good because other beaches in spring break at this time, people don't care. They're walking on your blankets, they're throwing sand on you. They're pretty rude. It's kind of like everyone is all for themselves and that's why people enjoy this beach because it's way more secluded and you can just enjoy yourself. But a little while later, as the couple was walking back down the shore, they passed the girls a second time. And that's when the officer's wife noticed that the girls hadn't moved at all. They were in the exact same position and it was a slightly odd one. 
One of the girls was kind of on top of the other, hence why they gave them their privacy on the way out the first time. It just didn't appear to look normal the second time around, especially when they stared in their direction. The officer told his wife to stay there and he went to investigate. He could tell right away that something definitely wasn't right. He saw blood and he screamed to his wife, we gotta call the police, they're dead. Wow. How horrifying would it be to stumble upon that scene? Even for an officer like this, it's definitely shocking. It's not something you expect to see at a beach, especially in broad daylight and a beach like this. This was a family beach. Many locals enjoyed sunset strolls or afternoon picnics with their loved ones. You don't expect it to end in losing your life. So the officer and his wife, they rushed to a phone to report what they had just seen. The Franklin County Sheriff's Officer Warren Roddenberry was the first on the scene. He arrived around 3 p.m. He was familiar with Alligator Point since 1966, and he had never witnessed anything like this. There were no problems with women being attacked in this area. Roddenberry is a native of Southern Georgia himself. He actually graduated from Thomasville High School just like the girls. But he wouldn't put that together until later when the pair were identified. He found the two women lying lifeless in broad daylight with the midday sun now scorching their bodies. He scanned the immediate area and the radio was still playing rock music, which now seemed very eerie. It created a strange contrast between this tragedy and the carefree atmosphere of this beach. He sees their belongings are still there. Their beach bags were still on the blanket, which was undisturbed. Megan's car keys were right beside her, within reach. He located their wallets, which contained their IDs, as well as cash. So robbery definitely didn't seem like the motive here. The person who did this left a car and cash behind. Both girls were still wearing their bikinis, which were not tugged on, they weren't torn in any way. So a sexual motive was ruled out. So what happened to these girls? Megan had a towel over her head, which was soaked with blood. And Cherish was lying on top of her with a gunshot wound to her head. There was a lot of blood pooling around both of the bodies at this point. And there didn't seem to be any other marks on them. It didn't look like there was a struggle at all. It was as though they were just caught off guard and didn't see this coming whatsoever. Roddenberry was able to make a preliminary identification of both girls by looking at their IDs and matching them to their bodies. I can't even imagine stumbling upon something like this. He noticed that they were from his hometown and it got personal for him. What a small world that they were from the same tiny Southern town that he was from. He began looking around the area as he lined up transport for the girl's remains to be taken back to the medical examiner's office. He wondered if this was done by someone the girls knew. It didn't seem to make sense that a stranger would do something like this. How would they even know that the girls were here? It also appeared they were killed very close in time to one another. The fact that Cherish fell right on top of Megan signified that they were killed back to back, that she didn't have much time to move very far. It seemed like this had been planned, like someone had followed them from back home. But who would want these two young teenagers dead? Officer Roddenberry called in additional units from the Florida Department of Law Enforcement, the FDLE, to search the beach and the surrounding area, as well as interview beachgoers and locals to see if they heard or had seen anything out of the ordinary. Even though this was a secluded area of the beach, there were many other families, many other cars that were parked nearby, and residents who were close enough that they should have been able to hear or see something. There was one guy who said that he was down there every day, a regular to the area, and he said he heard what he thought was fireworks around about 12.30 or so that afternoon. And then he saw a car driving right nearby. And it was not a car that he's used to seeing. It looked to him to be a blue Chevy Nova or something like that. He said it was a kind of long car and I wasn't familiar with the style. So I looked it up. This is what it looked like. Officers went to look in the parking lot area. And that's when they discover Megan's black car parked in one of the designated spots. The Georgia license plate made it apparent this was most likely the car the girls came in. But then they see something odd. There's a car parked directly behind Megan's car, kind of blocking it in so that they couldn't get out. And there were ample spots for other cars to take. So why would someone choose to park right here of all places? 
Could this be the car the man saw? It wasn't a Chevy, but it was blue. So perhaps the guy who said it was a Chevy had been incorrect. As the officers get closer, they realize there's someone inside this car. So they go up to the driver's side window and there's a man sitting in the driver's seat with his car off and a camera in his lap. So they tell him, you need to step out of the vehicle. The officers wanna know, what is he doing there? The sun's about to go down. And this man's like, well, I've been here all day just taking pictures, like hence the camera. And the officers were like, pictures of what? He's like, wildlife. There's a lot of birds in this area. And one of the officers asked if this man saw any people while he was shooting pictures of birds. And the man said, well, yeah, there were a few down there. And so one of the officers goes a step further and he's like, how about some teenage girls? Did you happen to see them? He says, no, I don't think so. I can't recall. The guy's demeanor was just off. So they pressed him and he got defensive. And that's the worst thing you can do with a police officer. One of the many worst things you can do. So the cop gets kind of passive aggressive with him. And he made a snarky comment about maybe the guy got a few shots of some bikini clad teenagers in his roll of film. And that's when the dude kind of goes off on him. He's like, no, I'm not like that. I didn't take any pictures of teenagers dancing on the beach. Ha, huh, wait a minute. Who said anything about them dancing? So the officers get suspicious. He's offering up information that they had not provided to him. This gives them a reason to want to search his car. Of course it does. And the man says, wait, 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 wait. I have a gun in my glove compartment. And at that point, the officers decide they need to bring this man down for a formal interview. Even though at this point, he's pleading with them that he didn't do anything wrong. Well, by this time, it was getting late back in Thomasville. The girls had told their parents they would be back by evening and it's dinner time. Megan told her mom she would be home for dinner. So by now she's wondering why she hasn't shown up. When Megan didn't show up by 6 p.m., Shirley decided to call over to Cherish's house to see if they went over there instead, but they hadn't. And this worried her. However, the girls were responsible, so she figured, you know what? They're probably just having fun and running a little late. It was a waiting game now. Meanwhile, investigator John Richards from the Thomasville Sheriff's Office and Agent John Heinen from the Georgia Bureau of Investigation had been notified about Megan and Cherish. Back in Florida, Officer Roddenberry had started to put together a task force with other FDLE and a number of other agencies, including the Parks and Wildlife Department and the GBI, as well as the Thomasville Police back in Georgia. Two officers were sent out, one to Megan's and the other one to Cherish's home to notify their families about what had happened. And it was devastating for both households. It was like losing two daughters since the girls were so very close. And there is no easy way to tell someone that their loved one is never coming home. It's unbelievable. And of course, in the midst of all of this, time is ticking away. And though the officers try their very best and they're even trained to give these types of notifications and be sympathetic, they also need to ask questions. Their presence is twofold. They're there to be the bearer of bad news, but they're also there to gather information from the families that may aid them in their search for their killer. Megan's mom offered up some details about who her daughter spent the most time with. Megan was at the DeSantis household all the time, and if she wasn't over there, then the girls were over at Shirley's house. The only other person she spent time with was Cherish's boyfriend, Alex, who hung out a lot. And Shirley said he even came over the night before, but it was really late. However, she didn't think he had anything to do with something like this. But in any case, everyone is a suspect until they're ruled out. And what stumped the detectives was how the killer was able to get so close to the girls without them running away or there being a struggle of some kind. So it seemed like it had to be someone they knew or trusted or felt that wasn't a threat to them in order for them to be able to walk right up without a scream or either one of them running away. Right now, they still have that man that was blocking Megan's car at the station and they are grilling him until he finally admits he did see the girls. He still says he has nothing to do with the murders because they were alive when he passed them on the beach. He even takes a polygraph. And meanwhile, the medical examiner has determined that the girls were both shot twice in the head at close range with a 38 caliber weapon there were no other signs of injuries or forced intercourse. The man they were questioning had a nine millimeter and he passed the polygraph. 
So they let him go at this point. By the next morning, news had spread about the double homicide on the secluded Florida beach. Articles came out in both Florida and Georgia asking the public for any information they may have in relation to the crime. As their loved ones and schoolmates were struggling to understand and deal with this seemingly senseless murder that still remained a mystery. One classmate that wanted to remain anonymous, she said that she had been down to that same part of the beach before with a friend, just laying out in the sun. And that's probably what Megan and Cherish were doing. Nothing unusual. She said it was so hard to believe that her friend was dead, that she was still in shock. And it probably wouldn't even hit her until she went back to class and the girls weren't there. That's when it would really sink in. And when something like this happens in a small town, it's all the locals talk about. Every news station is out there trying to make it the biggest story because that's what's going to sell their papers. I say it all the time. It's sad but true. If it bleeds, it leads. So, of course, so many stories and rumors are spreading. And not all of the people were sympathetic. There was one lady that lived in Alligator Point, and she was interviewed. And she had only been living there for two weeks, but she was kind of victim-blaming. Not only did she portray Alligator Point as a rough area, she said that anyone that went down there without a man, a gun, or a dog was just stupid. As though they were just asking for trouble. But she didn't have any useful information to provide to police. Cherish and Megan weren't doing anything stupid. These were two young girls that were enjoying their spring break. And unfortunately, they were victims of an extremely unfortunate situation that was completely out of their control. No matter what precautions they took, they could have never anticipated the tragedy that unfolded. Clayton Taff was interviewed by police. He was the owner of the Point Lounge in Alligator Point. It was just down the road from where the girls were found. He was upset with the way that people were describing the area because this is bad for business. This murder is bad for his business and he relies on the customers feeling safe. He said this was the first time anything like this had ever happened. He also added that him and about five other guys were adding a sun deck to his business that Friday afternoon, and they were doing a lot of hammering, so they didn't hear a thing, and they weren't aware of anything that had gone wrong until law enforcement showed up to take a statement from him. He did say that the part of the beach where the girls were found was way more secluded than any other area that it faces east across the Appalachee Bay, and that it's not easy to find it if you aren't looking for it. If you didn't know where to look for the signs, you would drive right past it on the narrow country road that winds through the pines. So no one understood how anyone could have been randomly driving down that road and somehow found that particular area of the beach and gunned down two girls like this. It just didn't make sense. And that's why officers in Thomasville focus their attention on Alex Hunt, Cherish's boyfriend. They pay him a visit, and of course, he's absolutely distraught over the news that his girlfriend and her best friend, two people that he was very close to, had lost their lives. But the officers don't back down. They want to know why he was over at Megan's really late the night before. He tells the officer, I was just over there to see my girlfriend. They asked him, oh, did your parents know where you were going? And he's like, no, but they wouldn't care anyway. It's spring break. As they pressed him about the conversations he had with the girls, they asked him if he knew they were going to the beach and if he had made plans to meet them down there. He said they didn't talk about anything like that the night before and he had nothing to do with their murders. But that's when he says something that catches the officers off guard. He tells them he doesn't even own a gun anyway. The thing is, no one had mentioned a gun to him or anyone else. But of course, he could have read it or heard about it in the news. But it did raise a red flag. They want Alex's alibi, to which he replied that he was working at the plant he worked in in town and to have his employers give them the information. Investigator Richard does confirm that Alex was at work that day when the girls were killed. So Alex is checked off their list. That didn't mean the rumors stopped, though. There just wasn't a clear motive, so people were making up their own version of events, and this was before social media. Now, this is a common occurrence. So much speculation before the investigators can even do their job. Soon enough, false information had spread that the authorities had found the murder weapon, but that wasn't true. No weapon had been found at all. The only reason they knew the caliber of the weapon was due to the autopsies when they found the actual bullets. This story got a lot of coverage in the news, and it could have been because the girls were young, but it was most likely 
because it had to do with Pete DeSantis. He was connected. Even the governor of Georgia at the time, Zell Miller, was speaking about what happened. He was asking the public to come forward and he offered a $2,000 reward for any information that could lead them to the killer. Hundreds of calls were coming in and investigators had a lot more interviews to conduct. One person came forward and talked about how the area the girls were in used to be a nude beach. And it was true. And not only that, the police had been out there a few times recently for calls about women sunbathing topless. But again, this was an attempt at explaining why the girls were targeted, but both girls were wearing their bikinis and there were no signs that this crime was sexually motivated. It was just another piece of information that seemed pretty useless. I mean, why would that lead to their murder anyway? Would someone be that upset that they would turn a gun on them for being topless on a beach? It just really did not make sense. It seemed a little bit like victim blaming yet again. By Monday, March 30th, just a couple days after the girls were found deceased on the beach together, they were buried in separate funerals, but at the same cemetery, Laurel Hill, where their loved ones went to say their final goodbyes. Megan's mom described her daughter as strong-willed and outspoken. Cherish's father said she was sweet and funny and she loved to make other people laugh. Both girls were so very loved by their friends and family and their loss was felt deeply throughout their entire community. Megan and Cherish's family members and friends were confused and upset they were desperate to understand what happened to them. The community of Thomasville was devastated and they were in need of answers. They wanted to know why two young girls were targeted and killed, why someone would commit such a horrific act of violence. By the time school started up again, it just seemed surreal. With both of the girls' empty seats in class, the principal, Jerry Sutter, commented that the few days of spring break that were still left between the murders and the students coming back did provide somewhat of a cushion, but the sadness was evident on campus. Some of the students did do interviews, and I have one of those that I thought was telling about the way these students felt. Makisha Tillman, she was a 17-year-old classmate of Megan. She said she always saw the two childhood friends, Megan and Cherish, teasing one another and walking down the hall, and Megan with her heavy Southern accent, and Makisha said she was having a really hard time dealing with her absence. She was crying and others were crying too. And a group of the students actually had to leave class to go get counseling with the guidance department. She also added that most people think Megan and Cherish must have told someone that they were going down there and they were followed to Alligator Point. She said, she's not scared, but she just wants to know who did this. Roddenberry knew from his interviews, it was common knowledge that the girls were headed down there. People knew but he couldn't confirm whether they knew the killer. They could have, that's all he could tell the public. And at this point, they still had no leads. I kept wondering if it had something to do with Cherish's father's tobacco business. Could there be someone upset with him in their business dealings, like a deal gone wrong, and so they take it out on his daughter? The FDLE and the GBI worked hard for weeks to solve the girl's murder, but they found no leads to pursue. Megan and Cherish's murders mystified everyone involved in this case. There seemed to be no motive for this crime, and the lack of evidence made it extremely difficult for police to determine who was responsible. Even the most seasoned investigators were baffled. The pressure from the community was building, like it usually does in a small community. But the local Thomasville police couldn't do much, Florida was leading the case. They had one clue though, that blue Chevy Nova. Back then, Georgia did not have a vehicle database that connected car colors to owners, but Florida did. So that is where they put their focus. They pulled up every record of anyone in the area who had registered a blue vehicle with the state of Florida. Of course, with the emphasis on any resident that had a vehicle similar to an older model blue Chevy Nova. And they sent out agents to investigate. They went door to door. It was a huge task. But these investigators, they weren't even sleeping. They were obsessively trying to track down every single car that could possibly match this description. And they would get a hit here and there. Someone would seem suspicious. They even tracked someone down that lived right across the street from the, one of the girls back in Thomasville that drove a similar car, but he had an alibi. Another person of interest came up on the radar. It was a guy who was lingering around the crime scene. And when the officers asked him for his identification, this man handed him a Department of Corrections identification card, like a prison card. This was a 28-year-old man. 
He had a long criminal record, over 13 arrests, and he had just recently been released from state prison. Again, it seemed like a very promising lead, but like all the others, it ended up that he had nothing to do with this crime. There was more and more speculation swirling around. Some people believed that the girls had been caught up in a drug smuggling operation. Yeah, that there were smugglers that had possibly come up on that secluded part of the beach, saw the girls, didn't expect anyone to be there, and shot them dead since they would have been witnesses. But after looking into this theory, there was no boat seen, there was no evidence that a boat came up on shore, no one saw anything, so they ruled it out and they moved on. But this case looked like it was going to be unsolved until a very strange phone call came in to the Franklin County Sheriff's Office in Tallahassee, Florida. A woman was on the other line. She was telling the investigators that she knew who shot the girls because she was there when it happened. So of course, they are dialed into what this woman is saying, reigniting their hope that they're gonna find the killer and bring justice and closure to this case for the girls' families. The caller says this man's name is Sammy Haynes and he lives about 16 minutes away from the beach, but she wouldn't give them any information about who she was. When they asked, she hung up and they tried to track where she was calling from, but they determined that it was a payphone. But this woman had just implicated herself in a crime having been at this scene. So they really wanted to know who she was, but there was no luck. However, they tracked down a guy named Sammy Haynes. They called the number associated with this local man and his father answers the phone. He says, oh, you're looking for my son, Sammy? Yeah, well, he works construction out in Atlanta, Georgia, and he was gone at the moment. Atlanta, well, that's a connection right there. He works out in Georgia. So he could have known the girls, seen them driving to Florida that day, followed them, so they had to track this Sammy guy down. But for now, they go to all these local establishments and see if anyone knows this man, had heard this name before, had interacted with anyone that might match this guy's description. So they go out to the bar in that area called the Point Lounge, whose owner Clayton Taff had already been interviewed. We heard from him before. Well, a bartender comes forward and she says, she recalls something very odd that happened the day of the murders. A weird interaction with a patron he comes in right when they opened. He orders a Bloody Mary, but she wasn't completely set up. She felt bad because she was trying to get things in order to make his drink and there was a delay. So she told him, you know what? It's on the house. Don't worry about it. But no, he insisted on paying. Doesn't really seem that odd, but he's like, you better keep that money because it'll be the first and last time I come in here. And it just kind of gave her the creeps. Maybe it was innocent though. Maybe he was just referring to the bad service. Like you better keep what you can get because you aren't getting this customer's money again, that type of thing. He was there for about 40 minutes or so, but this would have put him in the area the girls were murdered about an hour before they were found. And it's frustrating because you get what you think is a lead and then you go investigate because you have to and sometimes, you know, without cameras or anything else to go on, it goes nowhere. But the questions linger. And before they can really look into the Sammy Haynes guy, he calls into the station and he's still out in Atlanta, but expected to be back that night. So he agrees that he'll come in the next morning and speak with them. He does say that he is six hours away and that he was at the time of the murders as well. But they think he could have driven there and back. But he insists, no, someone's giving you false information about me. And that someone is probably my soon to be ex-wife's sister, Linda. This sounds so convoluted, but he said, check my alibi, I'm telling you. She's making this crap up about me. She is just trying to get back at me for something I did that she didn't like. And this sounds super extreme. This man was telling the truth. They tracked down Linda and sure enough, this was her way of getting revenge on him for not treating her sister right. I mean, this is a crime to interfere with a criminal investigation. She could have been arrested, but right now they have more important things to worry about. Besides, Sammy's alibi checked out, so they just check him off their list. But due to this false tip, Detectives spend their precious time, hours and hours of the day verifying it rather than investigating other leads. This is valuable time and money and energy wasted. And it also results in missed opportunities to solve the case. It was tough. This case was all anyone was talking about from Florida to Georgia. It was like the wounds couldn't heal, especially because there was no one in custody. There were locals that would call into the police stations and if one of the investigators on the case answered, they would go off on them. They would yell at them saying, why aren't you out on the streets finding the killer? But they were working this case nonstop. Still, if this next thing didn't happen, 
They may have never solved this case no matter how hard they worked on it. Friday, May 15th, around 10 a.m., a call came in to the Franklin County Sheriff's Office. A familiar type of call. On the other line was a woman from Tallahassee who said she knew who killed Megan and Cherish. She said it was her ex-boyfriend. Of course, the police weren't going to get their hopes up. This could be another jilted ex trying to get revenge or their 15 minutes of fame. So they asked her why she thought her ex killed the girls. And she said, because he told me he did. He had called her just the evening before and he sounded really odd. Like he wasn't right. There was something going on and he confessed to killing the girls at Alligator Point. They asked her, what's your ex's name? And she said, Robert Neil Rodriguez. And get this, it sounded familiar to one of the investigators and he looks down this list of people that he's already spoken to and this man's name is on it. They had crossed him off as not being a suspect. The reason he was on their list in the first place is because they knew he had a blue vehicle. So they asked his ex, did he drive a blue Chevy Nova? And she said, no, he drives a blue 1979 Plymouth Volare. These cars are so very similar. Look at them. They look almost identical to me. I'm not a car person, but they're similar enough. The ex-girlfriend couldn't provide much more information. She had no idea where he was now, but that he was leaving town and he had a gun. The last place that she knew he was living was with his mother at 520 East College Avenue in Tallahassee, Florida. He lived about an hour away from Alligator Point. So was this really the man responsible for these murders? What would he be doing in that area? But now that they had this man's name and the style of the car, they put out a bulletin across the entire country and they pulled up his information and they cross-checked it with what the man said when he had been on a telephone interview with them just a couple weeks ago. Back in the end of April, early May, they had contacted him in reference to his blue vehicle being registered in the state of Florida. Now, as soon as they search his name in their database, they're stunned at the results because Robert is a former police officer from Portland, Oregon. He was hired in March of 1975, but he resigned just two years later. Could this be one of their own had committed such a heartless crime? They call over to the Portland PD and retrieve Robert's personnel file. They wanted to find out as much information on this man as they possibly could while they're making calls and looking at his files. They're also sending a few officers out to his last known address. No one's there. So they knock on the neighbor's doors. And one of the neighbors said, Robert left his apartment around May 2nd or, or May 3rd. They weren't sure, but they did mention that he was very depressed since his mother, Lady Irene Rodriguez, had died on Easter morning. Wow, this was all too much. They felt like they were getting somewhere. However, they had done this before and it ended up not being a viable lead. By the time he left, did kind of match up with the time frame that they had called to interview him about his car and gone out there to speak with him. Now I wanna tell you what they gathered from Robert's personnel file from the Portland PD. He was born on an Air Force base in Southwest Florida in 1950 and was currently 42 years old. His father was a 22 year Air Force veteran and his family traveled a lot. They relocated several times while Robert was growing up, which forced him to move from school to school. And he attended at least seven different schools from Florida, Georgia, and Alabama during his childhood. In 1968, he graduated high school in Fort Walton Beach, Florida, which was about two and a half hours away from Tallahassee. Then enrolled at Okaloosa Walton Junior College before transferring out to Brigham Young University in Utah. Now, this is a very well-known Mormon university, and his personnel file stated that he did become a Mormon while attending this school. He spent the next two years doing Mormon missionary work out in Guatemala, and then he went back to Utah to graduate with his degree in law enforcement from Brigham Young. He was hired by the Portland PD thereafter until he resigned on good terms, according to his supervisor, Sergeant Derek Foxworth of the Portland PD. It was noted that Robert had no disciplinary actions or anything like that. Then he moved to Tallahassee in 1978, where he eventually tried to go back to school at Florida State University. He wanted to get into a different career at the time, but things just weren't really working out for him. And he spent the next few years between jobs and trying to go back to graduate school. He was currently working as a sign painter and a janitor. He was also a member of the Unity Christian Church where he would regularly give Sunday morning sermons. Robert had been married to a woman named Virginia Blyer from 1981 through 1985, but, According to her, 
the marriage ended because Robert was a drug addict. She said that her knowledge of drug addiction at the time was minimal, and she naively believed him when he assured her that he would seek treatment. But when she came to the realization that he wasn't going to, she ended the relationship. And like I mentioned, he did attend FSU as a graduate student studying political science, but he never obtained a degree. In addition to painting and working as a janitor, Robert held several jobs over the years. He was a car salesman. He delivered for the newspaper, the Tallahassee Democrat from 1985 to 1988, before going into bankruptcy in 1999. But where was Robert now? That's what authorities want to know. And they didn't have to wait too long for their next lead. Just eight hours later, around 6 p.m., the phone rang again at the Franklin County Station. This time it was a man's voice on the other end, and he identified himself as Robert Neal Rodriguez, the man whose ex-girlfriend had called in eight hours earlier and said he confessed to the double homicide at Alligator Point. Being a former police officer, he offered up his driver's license number as proof that he was who he said he was. And this is when this entire case gets crazier to me. It's something I've never heard happening before in any of my other cases, and that's why it interested me so much. He confessed to the officer that he was the killer, just like that. He admits it. And of course, they want to know where he is, and he tells them he's at a payphone off an interstate I-40 in New Mexico and had been traveling four days from Florida to that location. At that moment, they began the process of getting a warrant to search Robert's Tallahassee apartment. They also put out a statewide bulletin with the suspect's description that he was 42 years old, five foot eight inches tall, 155 pounds and balding, but had some dark brown and gray hair on the sides of his head with a neatly trimmed gray and black beard and mustache. He was said to be driving a dark blue 1979 Plymouth Voltaire with a Florida tag HWN05G. Just by the way the man was speaking, he seemed distraught, as though he was not in a very good state of mind, and authorities believed that he could be at risk for taking his own life. So they hurried to get this information out, but they were afraid to put his picture in the media because they wanted him to be brought in alive. And they were worried that if he saw himself in the media, it would set him off or set someone else off and that they would end up getting justice with their own hands. Robert provided investigators with information that only the killer would know. Things that were not published to the media, like the fact that there was a towel over Megan's face and other details as well. The detectives told him to turn himself in, that they could help him, but Robert was like, there's no way you can help me and I am not going to prison. It's a known fact that prison can be a very difficult place for police officers as inmates. In some cases, officers that face incarceration are placed in protective custody. They're there with sexual deviants or in the prison's medical facility because of the danger they face behind bars. They are targets. So instead of turning himself in, Robert told the detectives that he was on his way to the Grand Canyon where he was going to take matters into his own hands. And of course, they tried to talk him out of it. They tried to negotiate with him, but he said it's too late for that, and he hung up. The detectives knew they didn't have much time. The Grand Canyon was about six hours from New Mexico, so they had highway patrolmen and state troopers in New Mexico out there on the roads trying to locate him before it was too late. Back at his apartment, they were carrying out a search from top to bottom and they uncovered a collection of paperback books about death and other items they thought would be useful in this investigation, but they didn't turn up a 38 caliber weapon, like the one used on Megan and Cherish. They also reached out to the pastor at the Unity Church where Robert delivered the Sunday sermons. Her name was Reverend Julie Keene. She told detectives that Robert was fighting a battle within himself, a battle between his loving good part and a part that was angry and sick, and the sick side may have won. She described Robert as an articulate and bright graduate student at one time, but truly lacked focus and was merely playing at school just to find his way. That he was a good speaker, he delivered really good messages, but would also suffer from serious, unexplained bouts of depression. He told her he thought about taking his own life at least twice, and that he'd been taking the antipsychotic medication Prozac. It's been used to treat depression since it was approved by the FDA back in 1987. However, it had been linked 
to violent behavior and thoughts of self-inflicted harm. At that time, it was still being evaluated by the FDA. If you have any personal experience or knowledge about Prozac, let me know. I do not, but please leave it in the comments if you feel so inclined. At this point, they actually send out more bulletins and a nationwide manhunt begins. The next morning, on Saturday, May 16th at 9 a.m. Mountain Time, 11 a.m. Eastern, a call comes in to a police station out in New Mexico. The person on the other line is at a rest stop off of I-40 in New Mexico. It was a member of the Disabled Veterans Group, and they were doing a fundraiser out there. They said they found a blue Plymouth car parked nearby with a lifeless man inside. When local officers went out there to investigate, what they found alerted them to call the FDLE. The car had a Utah license plate and that really didn't add up. But sure enough, when they run that plate, they discovered that it had been reported stolen along with one other license plate from a motel parking lot in Utah on May 8th. When officers approached the vehicle, they saw what looked like a deceased or passed out man lying lifeless in the driver's seat. They opened the door and noticed a handwritten note on the dashboard. It was for whoever discovered his body. It read, cyanide poisoning by mouth. Do not do mouth to mouth, it may poison you. The man matched the description of Robert Rodriguez. And there was a clear glass vial with a white substance tied around his neck by a leather strap like a necklace. In the passenger seat was a brown folding notebook where Robert explained that he took cyanide to take his life for the sake of the girl's parents, for their peace of mind, and to avoid a prison term. The note went on to say that he mailed a letter to the Florida authorities. It was gonna be addressed to Special Agent Delbert McGarvey, and this letter would explain why he killed the two Thomasville, Georgia teenagers. Now, a 22 caliber weapon was found in the car, but they did not find a 38 like the one used in the homicides. FTLE agents and lab technicians were sent out to New Mexico that same day in order to make a positive identification of Robert Rodriguez through fingerprints. And this was later confirmed. They had their man, but they did not close this case yet because remember, they were expecting a letter. Well, they weren't the only ones that were going to get them. There were 11 letters in total sent out in the days before Robert took his life. He drank a mixture of scotch and cyanide. The story doesn't end here. Those letters held the clue to so much more than anyone could have expected. While the FDLE await their expected letter, they were able to put together a timeline of Robert's movements. After the news released the photo of Robert, the owner of the Point Lounge, Clayton Taft, remember him? We've talked about him twice. He came forward and confirmed that that man who came into his bar around noon and ordered a Bloody Mary on March 27th the day the girls were killed, was indeed Robert Rodriguez. He must have left somewhere around one o'clock that afternoon and made his way to Alligator Point, which was right down the road. And according to that off-duty officer that reported the girls' bodies, he and his wife initially passed them at 1.45 p.m. So they believe they were already dead before the second time they passed by when they got a closer look and called 911. The blue car that was reported being seen after the sound of gunshots around 12.30 was indeed Robert's. And though he would have been just leaving the bar at that time, it does coincide with the time frame. Then Robert's mother passed away on Easter Sunday, April 19th at an extended care facility. That day he called his ex-girlfriend and he was distraught and crying and he went over to her house where she talked to him and let him cry to her for several hours. Authorities did find out that his dad and brother were both deceased they were buried in Fort Walton, Florida. His brother died in 1966 and his father one year later in 1967. They weren't able to locate any other living relatives, which could have been the reason he finally confessed. They didn't know yet. But just a few days after his mother died in late April, investigators, including Agent Delbert McGarvey, the one who was expecting that letter to be addressed to him, they came out to talk to him at his apartment about his blue vehicle. The first time they went out, he wasn't home. So they left a card. And you know what Robert did? He actually called them back and he set up an interview and he offered to take a lie detector test. He explained to the detective that he was a police officer. And that's why they didn't really flag him as a suspect. At the same time, he was telling his ex-girlfriend he didn't even think he was a suspect, even after talking to investigators, because as a former police officer, he knew that they just had to cover all their bases. And he was right. 
he wasn't on their radar. At that point, his ex-girlfriend said that Robert asked her, do you believe me? Do you believe I didn't do it? And she said, of course. And she really didn't think he did. Not at all. She was actually floored when he called her that night to confess. When he initially left town, he wasn't really doing it in a suspicious way either. He said he was just going to his stepsister's house in Tampa. Days later, his neighbor said he did leave town. It was around the beginning of May, possibly the 4th or the 5th. He was in Alabama on the 6th, Colorado on the 7th, Utah on the 8th of May, where he stole the two license plates from a motel parking lot. And then he was off to Portland from the 8th to the 12th, and then he went off the grid. However, his ex-girlfriend heard from him, and she thought it was a little bit odd. He called her back on May 8th, and he said, Hey, can you do me a favor and clean Unity Church for me. That's where he was a janitor once a week and it was his only source of income. So maybe he was worried about not getting his paycheck or it could have been for an alibi. Even if they didn't see him at the church, they would have known it was clean. So it would buy him time. Something his ex found out a few days later he was running out of the night he called her from that payphone in the Midwest, confessing to the murders. He kept putting quarters in, but he said he's running out of gas and money. But finally, in a tearful voice, he said, I did kill those girls, but he didn't know why. And he added, I'm going to make sure that I won't be able to hurt anybody again. I'll make sure they find me and that this won't be one of those unsolved cases. I'll make sure they know I did it. He said he was going to take his life and begged her, please, please wait until the next morning to call the police. And she promised she would and she kept that promise. The next morning on the 15th, she called the police, and later that day, Robert called and confessed. By the next morning, he was found dead. But it could have happened any time between that 6 p.m. call and 11 a.m. Eastern when the individuals found him. When Megan and Cherish's parents got the news, they were equally stunned and confused. Why? They just kept saying, why? Megan's dad said he wondered if he was a hired killer. He had been suspicious for a long time that this was a professional hit, execution style. And I told you at one point I thought that too. The whole business deal gone wrong with the DeSantis family. Cherish's mother, Dot, had a question. She said, I wonder if he just hated young girls and he's some kind of serial killer. And this was after hearing about those books in his house about death. She just figured if he was so obsessed with killing, wouldn't he have killed more than two people by now? At that moment, she didn't know how close she was to the truth. Sunday, May 17th, the church members at Unity Church gathered for their normal weekly sermon, one that Robert frequently delivered. They didn't know him as Robert though. They called him Bob. And he wasn't like the man they were reading about in the newspapers. He was described by those close to him as a gentle soul, someone who helped others. I found this to be both interesting and scary that someone could have two strikingly different personalities in one way they could be so nice and the other so evil but we've seen this many times before ted bundy btk john wayne gacy they lived fairly normal lives many of the church members were crying and they were trying to comfort one another and they tried to just make sense of it all a woman that had recently been dating bob was sobbing uncontrollably and another woman said, the fact that he left that note warning someone not to give him mouth to mouth, that was just like him, looking out for others. That's something he would do. And a lady named Joyce Humphreys came forward to reporters and she said that Bob helped her through her divorce and that this whole situation has taught her that you really can't judge people, that she will never know what dark night of the soul he was going through. She could never read about criminals the same way she used to because now, she knew one personally. And now she's going to think about all the people who loved that person because they exist if she does. One of the other members was a man named Don Stewart. He worked as a psychologist at the Department of Corrections and he knew Bob personally through the church. He said the men he dealt with were nothing like Bob. And of course, Bob had expressed anger here and there about relationships going badly, but nothing out of the ordinary. He also made a comment that he'd like to think the loving environment at the church helped prevent him from doing more than he did. 
and maybe it had, but not forever, obviously, and it didn't do enough. What do you think of that? I know it's hard. It's hard to see this person as a human doing what he did, but they have these two sides to them. It's so scary to me that someone can be hiding so much. Unexpectedly, the Arizona Daily Sun in Flagstaff got a letter from Robert on the next day, Monday, May 18th. It was addressed to a reporter named Xavier Briant. This letter was the first of many that Robert had sent prior to taking his life. This one was intended to alert authorities to where his body was because he was expecting them to find it in the Grand Canyon, but he didn't make it that far. It was a one page letter and it began to the news staff. Here's a tip on a good news story for you. And then it went on to read, by the time you receive this, I expect to be dead by cyanide poisoning and or gunshot. You'll find my body on the side or top of a large hill, which can be approached by auto down a dirt road in the Coconino National Forest. The road is on the left of Highway 180, 30.8 miles from where 180 leaves Humphrey Street in Flagstaff, 22.7 miles past the last paved road on the left in the Snow Bowl going toward the Grand Canyon. If for some reason this is not possible, I'll be at the rim of the Grand Canyon, my car is 79 Plymouth Velare with stolen Utah tag 183FBR. And then it said, whether they know it or not, I'm wanted for three murders by the Florida Department of Law Enforcement. Agent McGarvey will appreciate a call from you when you find my body and will fill you in on the details. You may tell him that the third murder is of Valerie Hunt in 1984 and that he will receive full details on all three in the mail. Tell him you can take the weekend off. I don't think they can prove any of the three, but I can't live with myself if I'm going to act like this. Thank you, Robert Rodriguez. Three killings? That's right, three. Wow. See how crazy this is? I told you, I've never heard of a case like this before. So of course, the media went crazy after the story came out. Who was this third victim? Valerie Hunt. Well, she was a 22-year-old girl from Tallahassee Community College. She was a student who disappeared in 1984. Her body was found that same September near a sinkhole near a pond off State Road 267 in Wakulla County, Florida. Valerie Hunt worked for Home and Land Publishing Corporation, and her supervisor described her as a responsible and valued employee. He told the Tallahassee Democrat that it was completely unlike Valerie to take off without notice. Law enforcement officers searched the woods near Lofton Pond on horseback, on foot, and by helicopter for Valerie. Divers searched the pond, but they still could not locate her. She was a strong swimmer, so her family thought it was not likely that she would have drowned. And after a few days with no sign of Valerie, a massive search of Lofton Pond was finally called off. But during the investigation into Valerie Hunt's disappearance, more information emerged. Valerie's roommate told investigators she was last seen on June 11, 1984, before she left town. She said that Valerie's boyfriend reported her missing when her boss called him to tell him that Valerie hadn't shown up for work. This was four days later. By September 1984, there was still no sign of Valerie. At that point, her friends and family offered a $2,000 reward for information leading to her whereabouts. Investigators refused to admit that foul play was involved. They only considered her missing and that her disappearance was, quote, suspicious at the time. They still believed that Valerie could have left on her own, but they were wrong. And it was confirmed through dental records that skeletal remains discovered in September of 1984 belonged to Valerie Hunt. But now, all these years later, Leon County Sheriff Sergeant John Livings, who had been investigating Valerie's case at the time, eight years earlier, he was contacted regarding this recent confession. He wanted to set the record straight and say, this case was never closed. Valerie's cause of death had never been able to be determined. Since sadly, her remains were severely decomposed by the time she was found. An anthropologist from the Florida State University did try to assemble her body in an attempt to determine her cause of death, but it still remained unknown. He also wanted to point out to the media that they mistakenly put out information that she was abducted from a Westwood shopping center, but that was not true. There was no evidence that that ever happened. And as a matter of fact, she was heading out to the same pond where her body was later found near. It was a sunbathing spot off of Spring Hill Road. Sound familiar? Valerie has stopped to get some gas 
And then she went to the store to get her dad a Father's Day card, then went to the bank before heading out to the pond that day, something that she did quite often. She would go there all the time, whether she was alone or with friends, and she wasn't reported missing, like I said, until like three days afterward. Her car was found seven days later on Lofton Road, and the skeletal remains located in a heavily wooded area off of State Road 267. It couldn't be determined if she was shot or stabbed, but at the time, they ruled it strangulation. The sergeant said he still had Valerie's file on his desk, and every so often, he would go over to it, open it up, look for any leads. Valerie was a good-natured girl. She had a lot of friends. She loved cats, and people said she wouldn't do anything to hurt anyone. The sergeant said he wasn't going to close her case just yet, just because this letter came out confessing. He would need more proof but he wanted to provide closure to her family. But one thing's for sure, all three ladies were sunbathing, or so it seemed, with this confession of the third murder. And the sergeant coming forward to enlighten the media on the fact that the story that they had been running for years was not consistent with the truth. That she was not taken from a shopping center, but instead from where she was laying out in her bikini. How sad. This new revelation prompted Megan's mom to make another statement. And this time, she said she was very on edge about why this whole thing happened. She said to me, he took the coward's way out. And she went on to say, It makes me wonder how he physically was able to walk around and why he waited eight years to have this passion for murder again. And I agree. It's very interesting. And now we wait once again for the next letter. Sure enough, the next day on May 19th, FDLE gets that letter addressed to Agent at Albert McGarvey, just like Robert said. It was a six-page letter, and they would keep it under wraps until they could verify everything. What they did release publicly is what we already know. Robert repeated the confession he made by phone that he was responsible for ending the lives of Cherish and Megan, and that he also took the life of Valerie Hunt. Something else was made public. Robert made comments that alluded to other letters he sent. It sounded as though he sent the teenager's parents' letters as well. So they alerted the families to be on the lookout and to notify authorities if they were to receive anything in the mail because it would be considered evidence. Right now, the investigators were going line by line and they stated that this letter contained more than 60 leads that they had to follow up on. But when they were asked if he confessed to any more murders, they said no, that there was no evidence in the letter that would lead them to believe that he was a serial killer or responsible for any other killings at this point. And I just wanna point out, when I was researching this case, he was filed under being a serial killer. The thing is, he killed three people, but it's usually three people in three different circumstances that make someone a serial killer, not two people at once, and one other person. So he's not a serial killer. Not yet anyway. A spokesperson for the FDLE, John Joyce, said that they did not have any other confessions to any other crimes. There was nothing in that letter that led them to any other grave sites or anything like that. But it didn't mean that this man didn't kill anybody else at some other point in time somewhere else. There just wasn't any evidence in the letter. And they weren't going to jeopardize any investigations by putting the contents public at that point. However, remember Sheriff Warren Roddenberry? Well, he did speak publicly about the matter, saying that it appeared that this was a random act of violence. He stated that Robert didn't appear to have known Megan or Cherish personally, and they were still putting the facts together about the third victim. His car was being shipped back from New Mexico to their headquarters in Florida for a more thorough investigation. That same day, Robert's ex-girlfriend received a letter in the mail, and it was said that a different ex-girlfriend also received a letter, and both of those letters expressed remorse for what he had done. The very next day on May 20th, the DeSantis family, Cherish's mom and dad, they received a letter from Robert. Peter contacted FDLE as soon as he was notified by USPS, who intercepted the letter at the post office. The police department took the original, and they said they would send him a copy to keep. They told him not to release anything publicly, but they didn't stop him from talking about how it made him feel to know what was inside that letter. He said that he had never had possession of it, he had never touched it, but he knew what it said. Well, the very next day on May 21st, Megan's dad, John, received a letter as well. And he too had to turn it over to police, but he did speak publicly about it. And I probably would too. 
I don't think they could hold me back. And I'm really glad he did because I was really curious. I'm sure you are too. And I wasn't purposely keeping it from you. It's just that going by this timeline, this is what was happening. It was a lot of suspense. John Carr, Megan's dad, he was angry more than anything else. He said he saw both of the letters, one to the DeSantis family and the one to him, and they were pretty much identical. And neither one of them offered an apology at all. John said, it took this guy a page and a half, but he sort of explained why he did it. It seemed to John that Robert had a lot on his mind. From the letters we know about at least, he must have done a lot of writing in a short period of time. John was referring to his letter, the one to the other family, the two to his girlfriends, the law enforcement agents, and the one to the Arizona paper. They were all written the same day, most likely. He went on to say that the letter provided some detail on how Robert had done what he'd done, but he wished that he hadn't. He did not disclose those details, but he did say from the letter, apparently, Robert just happened upon them. He said he did it to satisfy some fantasy to kill a young girl. He stated, quote, when I think of this worthless son of a bitch, it must have made him feel like a man to pull a trigger and put two bullets in my little girl's head. I don't understand why he waited eight years between the killings. I think he got some religion, then he lost it, and then went out and killed again, end quote. That could have very well been true. It wasn't until August that the officers were finally released the 11 letters that Robert wrote. And I tried my best to gather as much information as I could because even though the news said that they were released, I couldn't find any full letters, only parts. He wrote one to each of the three victims' families, Cherish, Megan, and Valerie's, and one to his church, the Arizona newspaper, FDLE, two to his ex-girlfriends, and some to his friends. The longest was the six-pager to FDLE. In that letter, Robert stated, quote, I can't say this word, uh, no forced intercourse, no provocation, no excuse, end quote. He also said after the 1984 murder, he told himself, this is not me. I could live a normal life and not repeat this. And if I did repeat, I would take my own life. Police noted that Robert had gotten divorced shortly before the 1984 murder of Valerie Hunt and had just broken up with his girlfriend before the murders of Cherish and Megan. Recall his church friend that said that, uh, you know, he would get angry now and then about relationship stuff. Well, maybe this is how he took out his anger. In each letter, he confessed to killing all three girls and that he didn't actually know why he was taking his own life, whether it was keeping him from killing again or from avoiding a long prison sentence. He stated that, quote, people have a right to be free of random killings and I cannot live with myself if I cannot trust myself to avoid such actions. Today, I'm going to sit on a hill and take my life, end quote. In the letter to Valerie's family, and I have part of that one, here's the section right here at the end when he signs it. It said, I'm sincerely sorry for my actions and for your long suffering wondering what happened. I assure you that Valerie suffered little and for a little time. I hope my death will calm your heart somewhat. I have no explanation and I do not myself understand my actions. Again, I am sorry even into death. God bless you. Bob Rodriguez. P.S. Please do not blame yourselves. I did this, not you. Please let the blame rest with me in my grave where it belongs. My question is, why would the family blame themselves? I just wondered that. There's no way I would be blaming anyone except the killer. Valerie's father told the Tallahassee Democrat that Robert Rodriguez caused his family heartache three times. When Valerie disappeared, when her body was discovered, and now when he wrote them and confessed. He said, I'm glad it's over for myself and my two children. In the letter to Cherish's family, he wrote in part, on May 27th of March of this year, I went to Alligator Point in search of someone to force intercourse on, he used the R word, and to beat up. A long time mental obsession that I have no explanation for nor understanding of. He had a lust for forcing women into intercourse, but he never did that to his victims. He went on to explain he encountered Megan and Cherish sunning themselves. They did nothing to provoke me. I claim no excuse for my actions. Recall how Megan's dad said that he sort of explained how he did it, but he wished he hadn't? Well, apparently, I guess in his mind to help the parents deal with the death, Robert said he shot each girl twice within no more than five or 10 seconds. I guess that's to explain how quick it was that they didn't suffer, but I can see how that sounds just so heartless and cold. And he offered 
no emotions in these letters and no apologies. There was no real solace given to any of their loved ones. He went on to explain that he never met the girls before and he chose them because they were young and attractive and in an isolated area. Wow, that is so sad and sick. I saw something that appeared to be an excerpt from one of the letters to the reporter at the Arizona newspaper. That he said he shot Megan first and then Cherish began to scream and back away. So then he shot Cherish. And he had no excuses and there is no one else involved or anyone with any personal knowledge of the crime. All the letters were pretty matter of fact and they lacked emotion. Investigators later provided more context. That Megan was holding a towel when he shot her and it ended up over her head from the force of the bullet and she fell backwards and it just flew over her. It wasn't put there. That he shot Cherish because she screamed and then he went and shot both of them one more time to make sure they were dead before fleeing the scene. Okay, I found this to be very interesting and that's why I wanna share it before the end of this video. Unity Church provided FDLE with an excerpt from a sermon that Robert delivered on July 15th, 1990, just two years before he killed Megan and Cherish and this is what it said in part. Wait till you hear this. It was a very, very interesting to me. This is probably one of the most interesting things in this case. And I'm gonna tell you, it is eerie and telling. He said, quote, one of my favorite stories that I ever have read in my life, I happened to read in a Newsweek magazine. The fellow who shot George Wallace is named Arthur Bremer. And he kept a diary while he was traveling around the country trying to find a politician that he could get close enough to shoot. In this diary, he said that on a particular day, he had lost his girlfriend. And in his mind, she was the only person who ever really loved him in his life. He was pretty down that day and he was pretty upset. So what he did was he gathered up a bunch of ammunition and two guns and he loaded the guns and took his ammunition with him and started down a street in Milwaukee. And he was going to go stand on a street corner and murder people passing by. Just kill whoever happened to be there. And then his diary said that on his way to that street corner, you can imagine what he looked like that day. He probably wasn't Mr. Friendly, but on his way to that street corner, he passed by a restaurant. And a waitress who was waiting a table at that restaurant looked up from what she was doing. And she smiled at him as he went by. And he turned around and went home. There are probably 20 or 30 people alive today because that waitress smiled at Arthur. Their children and their children and their children will be affected by that woman's love of a man who didn't look loving that day. End quote. End excerpt. End this man's sickening thoughts because wow. Just wow. I wouldn't go so far to say a random waitress had love for some stranger passing by a restaurant she worked at. That's not love, that's merely kindness. But to think that Robert, in his unhinged mind, thought that this was the best story he had ever read about a waitress smiling at a psychopath who was on his way to annihilate random people because his girlfriend dumped him. And that one smile stopped the killer in his tracks. We're supposed to be in awe of that? Arthur Bremer. Robert's muse in the story was also born the same year Robert was in 1950 and he attempted to murder a U.S. presidential candidate, George Wallace, on May 15th, 1972. May 15th is the same day that Robert confessed, might I add. Arthur also shot and injured three innocent people. He was sentenced to 35 years in prison and was released in November of 2007. Robert had a lot in common with Arthur, actually. Arthur also attended college but never got his degree and it said he dropped out and did odd jobs here and there. And then when he was demoted to busboy at a restaurant because patrons thought he was odd, he would talk to himself, well, he got angry and he quit. And guess what he did afterward? He became a janitor, just like Robert, except he wasn't doing it at a church, he was at an elementary school. After his girlfriend that he'd only been dating for a short while broke up with him in 1972, Arthur began his An Assassination's Diary which is actually a book he wrote and it's published. Robert must have just read that one little excerpt in a magazine that he stumbled upon. The book begins with this line. It's my personal plan to assassinate by pistol, either Richard Nixon or George Wallace. I intend to shoot one or the other while he attends a campaign rally for the Wisconsin primary, end quote. What he really wanted was fame. And although he did get a lot of media attention, 
it faded, and he never reached the infamy of his idols. But somehow, he was someone so notable to Robert, so much so that he would deliver a whole sermon about a smile that made him spare a group of innocent people. Too bad Robert couldn't spare Megan, Cherish, and Valerie. Robert died before they could press charges against him, but they considered his letters a full confession of his crimes. The FDLE did preserve samples of his hair, his blood, and DNA in case they were to ever need it to match to any of their cases in the future. Many people were glad that there wasn't a trial. Shirley told a childhood friend of Megan's, her name was Margaret McDaniel, how she felt in one word, closure. Megan and Cherish lived their lives together and they died side by side. That special bond that they had was never broken, even though the hearts of so many of their loved ones were, and they can never be mended. I'm so sorry to all three of these victims' families, and I wanted to note that Cherish's mom did pass away in 1997, just five years following her daughter's murder. Megan's family also saw another tragedy. Her brother, John Clark Carr III, who went by Clark, was found dead in a burning house in Thomasville, Georgia. His family found him shortly after 6 p.m. on Saturday, the 28th of September, 2013. They went there going to look for him after he could not be contacted. He was 44 years old at the time, and his body was found on the dining room floor near the back door, and the fire seemed to be set on purpose using an accelerant. An autopsy was said to have been conducted and that they were going to release the results, but I could never find any more information about this. Megan's mom and dad lost both of their children. Clark left behind his wife, Renee, and a child named Taylor. Megan's mom, Shirley, passed in 2016. I just want to thank you so much for giving these victims your time, for getting to know them, for spending your time here, and helping me continue to let their memories live on forever. I thank you so very much for watching. I will see you in my next video. Bye.